Welcome into the Autzen Audible's podcast. I'm Matt Preem, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack on the show. Uh, we are breaking down the Oregon second spring scrimmage, meaning we have the rare instance of recording a podcast over the weekend. Uh, hope I'm sure much uh, people out there who, who listen to this show will not be complaining that there's a mid, there's a weekend podcast. But uh, two practices in now, guys, for spring football. Um, you were, you two were at. The first two, uh, I attended my first one today after missing the first practice being in at, at men's basketball tournament in Vegas. Um, and I think we both come away with, with some interesting observations with Dan Lanning. Um, you guys mentioned on Monday's practice report of just how involved he is with the microphone and um, my first opportunity that, to see him. I was taken back at just the energy that he has, the involvement he has, and and multiple position groups drills individually. You don't see that quite often. The last couple of head coaches have kind of stuck with one position group for the most part and let the other coaches handle that. Uh, it's very small sample size, but nonetheless, that's just one of my first takeaways um, from this. And Eric, just some injuries we should note um, that not everyone was available for, for this second spring practice. Yeah, it's pretty much the same list we had from Thursday. Uh, Dorlis, Popo, Keonwar Hudson on the defensive line, all limited, or I don't think really did much anything besides rehab. Justin Flo, Damon David, same story there. Um, tight ends, Cam McCormick and Patrick Herbert, also off to the side all day. Um, I don't think we noted this on Thursday, but I, I'm sure this was the case then too. Both Ram Walden and Jonah Miller, who were I think suffered pretty serious injuries a year ago, same deal. Didn't take part. They're off to the side. Um, Jonathan Dennis was kind of, I think probably you'd list him as like a partial participant. It seemed like he was around some stuff, wasn't around others. Um, Alex Forsyth, this is the same thing two days in a row for us. Um, saw him walking in both times. I've chatted with him. He seemed like he was in good spirits and then we didn't see him at all. I don't know. He's like hiding somewhere, but um, he's around the team. He's available, but he's not even, I mean, I don't even think I saw him once we walked into the, practice terms jared right i mean i didn't see him at all no i didn't see him either so yeah so that's kind of where you got from a health thing I, um we should note we talked with with dan a little bit via zoom he was optimistic about guys coming back but um again was pretty just pretty cautious with what he would share with injury stuff which is not i guess unusual but yeah I, that, that's kind of your injury report a lot of key guys on defense unavailable right now and that might be a really good thing for a guy like uh, Sam Taimani, who's just arrived, or a Jackson Powers Johnson, or a Keanu Williams, who I think Jared said was one of the, the first guys to go through the D-line drills today. So um, maybe not the worst thing in the world, assuming these guys are able to get back and healthy whenever that is. Hopefully, maybe for some of them it's by the next time they practice on the 29th. Uh, it's a big weekend um, for Oregon. One, it's spring practice. They had their first on Thursday and then second today. It's also a big recruiting weekend, and um, there are five different five-star recruits on campus between three recruiting classes. Two of them are in the 22 class, two are in the 23 class, and one uh, is in the 2024 class. Um, and we saw some of those guys taking in practice today, uh, watching the Oregon players at their respective position groups perform. Um Mateo Lugulele, uh, DJU's younger brother, the highest rated guy on campus out of the group of five five stars. Uh, he is the number five player in the country for the 2023 class, an edge player who also is a tight end. Um, he was there. We saw him checking out practice. We also saw um, 2024 four-star quarterback um, Dylan Rayola out of Arizona. Yet again, another Arizona player. Uh, checking out the Oregon football program. Um, really, I, look, we're not going to touch too much on it because the, the weekend is going on still and there's still a, a ton of news to change here. But just yet again, I think this was an important uh, note that we needed to make um, with prospects checking out Oregon for the first time with new coaching staff. Yeah, and I'm guessing that they it was pretty intentional to have a spring mm -hmm. practice overlap with this weekend and give an opportunity for these guys to see what it's like to, you know, for Oregon to practice. And it's not just us, our first time watching them practice. It's not just a lot of the players. It's their first time practicing. It's these recruits get an opportunity to see what a Dan Lanning led practice looks like. And I'm sure it felt like it was important to showcase that over the last couple of like, Thursday and Saturday, I guess. 
Yeah, extremely important. You know, group of five, five stars coming in. You need to show exactly what this program is, uh, who they are under Dan Lanning. And, you know, again, we only get to watch the first 15 to 20 minutes of practice, which is probably the most boring part of Oregon's practices because 10, minute of it, 10 minutes of it is spent watching them stretch and then watching them into special teams drills. Um, but I'm sure for the next hour and a half that they're there, the next hour, whatever the case may be, for the recruits, that's a that's a big impression left on them. Just because in those 10 to 15, 20 minutes that we have, although it's boring, it's still really intense. You have Dan Lanning going from, I don't know if he went from field to field, guys. I was only on the defensive side of the field, so I saw him go up and down the field. I don't know if he went left or right. I think he just, I think he just stayed on your side. Yeah. When I saw him. Um, yeah, he went up and down, uh, worked a lot with the defensive line and linebackers, obviously, him and Tosh Lupoy. Just really intense on the field. Um, strength and conditioning coach, Wilson Love, big intensity guy. I mean, obviously, you should be that as a strength and conditioning coach, but um, there's no drop-off between intensity levels between him and Aaron Feld. Um, I think the only difference is just the mustache at this point in terms <laughs> of intensity levels. Um, but, yeah, that, that leaves a huge impression on recruits because um, you want to know what you're getting into, and especially with somebody like Josh Connerly or Labius Overton, um, 2020, 2022 guys, like whoever they decide to go to school with is who they're going to in the next few months. So it's a big, it's a big investment for them. It's a big investment for the program as well. Um, and yeah, you know, they certainly want to put their best foot forward and before they go on a nice little 17 day hiatus. All right. When we come back, uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to discuss some Jeffrey Bossa news of why he moves to inside linebacker full time, at least for now. Um, some decisions of where Oregon will be practicing or lack thereof, uh, and also just kind of what's next for Oregon moving forward uh, from a spring ball standpoint. All right, welcome back uh, to the Austin Audible's podcast. Uh, we got some good insight here on Jeffrey Bossa, probably one of the star players from the 2021 season. Um, showed up at Oregon last year as a true freshman, as a safety uh, out of necessity, moved down to the inside linebacker position because of depth issues and kind of has played his way into staying there. And we got some more feedback on that. Yeah, so Lanning, Lanning was asked about Jeffrey Bassa and his transition to linebacker. Um, under the previous regime, Mario Cristobal mentioned that Jeffrey would be moving back to safety for the next season. Um, so I think that was a big question mark for a lot of people going into the season where he would be lining up for the 2022 season. He is still the same number, 33, and he is now listed as an inside linebacker for Oregon. Um, and Landing basically just said there's no such thing as a Mike linebacker anymore. And by Mike linebacker, you know, think think someone like Brian Erlacher or, or a little bit of Ray Lewis, Teddy Bruschi, um, linebackers who just are great ball stoppers at the line of scrimmage. Um, they're decent in coverage, um, but what what Landing loves about Jeff Bossa is his ability to be sideline to sideline. He has the athleticism of a defensive back, he said, with um, the physicality of a linebacker. And you know that's what you saw from Bossa in his you know in his short stint as a linebacker last season. You saw the athleticism of somebody who can be a safety, but you saw the physicality, the size. Um, the hitting ability of someone who could be a linebacker opposite of Noah Sewell or opposite of Justin Flo, whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's it, it's one in which I think there's a lot of talent there, and it it should be one where you guys there? Are you? Yeah, yeah, we're here. Okay, I, it was weird. I just felt like we were no worries. stalled out. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I, I, I like the move. I think it sticks. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out for that position group, um, especially when Justin Flo gets back, because like Eric mentioned at the beginning, he's, he's not back yet. And maybe that's the necessity of why they need to keep him there. Yeah, I'll be curious to see. I mean, I, I think you think about the inside linebacker room, it's pretty exciting now with Sewell and Flo. And I think we all think LaDuke and, and Brown have a lot of potential bosses there. Um, you know, it's a, to strike the defense. I think they were asked about that before. We felt that way before we knew where Boston was at. And, you know, I think it made sense. In my mind, I was kind of expecting he'd play somewhere else. That's why I wrote in our predictions on the two deep. But um, 
obviously that communicates confidence in what they have at safety and, and that star position. Um, you know, and Adrian Jackson, we should note, also somebody who's reportedly playing inside. I mean, it's, yeah, they've got some dudes there and some guys with some real athleticism. And, and I'll be curious to kind of see how that looks when we get closer to the fall. We're going to have you. Spring. Oh, Go ahead, Jared. I was going to say, Eric, you and I talked about this on Thursday after the first spring practice about like our love for the Adrian Jackson move to inside linebacker. It just makes so much sense because he and he and Jeffrey Boss are like almost very are honestly are very similar in terms of phys- physical like nature and their size. Um, both have, you know, uh, linebacker instincts seemingly, but both have the size and the speed of a defensive back or somebody who could potentially play in the secondary. Yeah. Um, I think for him to join with Bossa, Leduc, Flo, Sewell, Keith Brown, um, even and Devin Jackson and Harrison Tiger coming on, and even the, one of their walk-ons and Michael Roth, who actually got some playing time last year and didn't wasn't wasn't terrible, which is the best thing you can, you can ask for from a walk-on. Um, that's a really deep room. They're going to be loaded, and that's uh, going to be exciting, especially with landing at the helm, you know, coaching them specifically. Yeah, it's going to be a strength of the defense, no doubt. I do wonder, um, Lanning said that one of the biggest adjustments that they're trying to make is making sure that guys are getting quality and quantity snaps at different positions. Um, I wonder if Jeffrey Boss is staying at inside linebacker early on is maybe taking advantage of an opportunity of lack of depth because Flo's not here right now, or Flo's not full go right now. And Taggart and Jackson aren't here yet. And there's, I think there's a good possibility both of them are here when spring practice resumes again. And maybe this was just an opportunity to just, hey, let's keep Bossa there for two or three practices and see how it works. I mean, I, I think he sticks, but maybe that's just reading into what Laning said of, you know, across multiple positions and getting guys reps and, and seeing how they fit. I wouldn't be terribly surprised to see people playing different spots when we come back. Um, it feels like to me, I would just start if Bossa feels like a fit better at star or safety, I'd probably yeah. just start him there at camp just the beginning, but yep. I don't know. I mean, it, we don't, one of the things with, with coach landing is he's, he's doesn't really give a lot away. Um, yeah. So a lot of what we're talking about is kind of reading between the tea leaves, I guess, if you will. And um, players are where they are and he gives a little information and then he kind of move on. So it, some of the personnel stuff is maybe a little harder to, read between than previous staffs. I think if if Basso were only playing linebacker for these first two days of depth for depth reasons, he would probably be playing safety for depth reasons because that's a position where I don't think their depth is nearly as good. Um, but like Eric, like Eric said, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody started to play a different position come, you know, in 17 days. Um, I don't expect it to be Basso though. Spring, uh, spring scrimmages. They're going to have two before the spring game. Um, but what has historically been a deal where Oregon in the spring will go up to Portland. Um, don't know if that's going to happen yet. Yeah, Dan said it wasn't, at least not for spring. Now, he didn't discount it possibly being a thing in the future. Um, maybe they go there in the fall. Maybe they go there next spring. Uh, my guess is they're just figuring out this is a really important time for culture building, and, and let's not – Let's not do anything totally out of the ordinary. Let's kind of stick with our schedule and our plan. And we don't have dates for scrimmages. We don't know if we'll be able to watch much of those. So my guess is probably not based upon what we've had so far from an access perspective. Um, we'd love to be wrong. We'd love to get out there and actually see some some action. But, um, yeah, for those from Portland, now this is a question we got asked quite a few times. Um, you will not have an opportunity to watch a spring scrimmage in Portland somewhere. Typically they've been in, like, Hillsboro, Big Beaverton area. That's not an on the table right now. Um, obviously the spring game on the 23rd, I would imagine will be the only opportunity for, for really all of us to watch, um, this team kind of partake in any sort of scrimmage periods. It's a shame, honestly, I, but I, I'm not surprised to hear it. Um, you know, this is Lanning's first spring cap, spring football camp or practice schedule as a head coach. Um, that's not priority number one. Uh, it might be priority number one for the some of those in the administration in terms of getting like the big Portland donors to be at the games or the, the practices, whatever the case may be. Um, for Landing, it's just honestly looking about all what's in front of him. And if he just needs to have practices always at the HDC or always in Austin Stadium, whatever the case may be, that's just what he's going to do. 
Um, so, you know, it's unfortunate for, for fans in Portland and in the surrounding area to, you know, to miss out on a spring practice. Um, I guess it, you just got to make the drive down on April 23rd at 1 p.m. to watch the Ducks play in Autzen Stadium. I was just going to say, just theorizing here a little bit, th- this staff has been very vocal about filling Autzen Stadium for the spring game. Um, I even think – I. If I remember right, I think Dan Lanning even like, let's sell it out type of a deal. Um, and look, every coach says that for every spring game. But this just feels maybe a little bit different, um, a little bit more concentrated effort. And it's going to be the first opportunity where, knock on wood here for a second, that uh, restrictions will be lifted for outdoor events for Austin Stadium since COVID has started. And so maybe it's a, hey, new head coach, new restrictions are all gone. Uh, first opportunity for you to, to be in Autzen with, you know, without any vaccine to show or what, what have you. And so maybe by eliminating the opportunity for the average fan that wants to go watch a spring game and says, oh, well, they're coming to Portland. Let's just go to that one instead and we'll watch a spring game on TV. Maybe this is just a strategy to, to force the, the 30,000 fans in Portland that maybe consider coming down for games in the fall to to come down for the spring game itself. Could be. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't not make sense. I also, I'm my my guess is, is like, I mean, that could very well be part of it. And maybe it's a double, I mean, maybe it's a couple things. I also think like maybe they really just want to be careful in what they show the public right now, Um, you know, and they're trying to, they're trying to improve some things. I I will say like, we didn't get it. We haven't got to see a ton so far. I'm guessing that's going to be the case throughout. And I think, you know, the less information that's out there, maybe the better for, for kind of building up, the expectations for a spring game. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I just think the general conceit is basically if you want to watch this team before fall, you're going to be at Austin stadium on the 23rd. That's really going to be your only option it's, yeah. it, from what we know right now, maybe it'll change, but that's, that seems to be what has been communicated thus far. All right. Um, wrap this up here. Oregon's off now for a couple of weeks. Um, spring break. We, Landing talked a little bit about just the importance of players of using the opportunity to to get their academic stuff in order, um, to make sure that they, you know, stay in the weight room, stay watching film, build off of what you were able to get done in the first couple of practices um, for when they return, which will be a couple of weeks now. Yeah, March 29th, they will be back on the practice turfs. So they will then hold 12 practices. Um, with that culminating on the spring game on the 23rd and then the practice on the 25th. So um, our practice coverage, which I go, we should note, there's a lot of practice coverage stuff up on the site. There's practice report from earlier today um, that all three of us took part in and kind of outlining some of the things we stood out, you know, stood out to us. Um, we touched on some of it on this podcast, but if you want to kind of get more in-depth information, go check that out. You will not be seeing those again for a couple of weeks, and that's not because we're lazy and missing things. It's because there just isn't anything to go to. So March 29th, next opportunity uh, for that. And we will also say, like, we just had landing two times on Zoom. I think we're, I know we're going to get coaches and you know assistant coaches and, and players once we, that, all that kind of resumes in a couple of weeks. So um, I think a lot more information will come out in the month of April. That's going to be kind of where we learn a little bit more about what's going on from people outside of Dan Lanning. Uh, so make sure, like Eric said, go to DuckTerritory.com for more coverage there. Um, also, the women will be finding out their selection for the NCAA tournament. Um, that will come out Sunday night, so make sure to check out that. Uh, we'll also be waiting to see if the men get selected into the NIT, if they're going to be hosting a game or not. Dan Altman does want to play, um, so we'll see what happens there. Um, baseball continues to, to, to go on as well. Um, Jared's got coverage of that on duckterritory.com. Knocked off uh, a, a top team, I think, what, top two, number two team number in the two, country, yeah. Stanford, Friday Stanford. night. So read about all baseball coverage as well on duckterritory.com. Until the next podcast, you've been listening to the Austin Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.